as I mentioned yesterday, um, Ken and I were induced to each other um, November of 2008. And over these last 15 years, we have uh, spent time in ministry through the presbytery and uh, grown to love him as a brother, um, love his ministry. Uh, he is a teaching elder in our denomination and is a member of our presbytery, the Coastal Presbytery of the Mid-Atlantic. And um, lives in Richmond with his wife, Sharon, four kids. And um, so Ken's going to break open the word for us this morning. So come on up, brother. All right, thank you. Hey, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, you know, one of the real joys of my ministry is I do get to travel around to different churches. And uh, it's always interesting, exciting, fun, gratifying, meaningful to just drop in to what God is up to in some other place besides where I typically spend my time. And uh, I can assure you God is everywhere. God is doing things that we can't, can't even imagine. Uh, and I'm working with one church right now in Durant, Iowa. Okay, it's an Anglican church with a membership of about 16. And they're doing wonderful things in the name of the Lord. And it's just, it's so satisfying to drop in and see those things. And I'm happy to be with you this weekend. Um, we're going to turn our thoughts to the Word of God this morning. So as I dive in, I invite you to pray with me. Uh, Lord, I do thank you for this Word that you have given us. The Word is life itself. It tells us uh, what we ought to believe. It tells us how to live. It opens doors. It opens eyes. It opens hearts. And as we open your word this morning, Father, I pray that you would speak to us uh, in ways that bring glory and honor to you, in ways that lift the name of Jesus high, in ways that strengthen us in our faith and encourage us in our ministries. And so we give you this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, many, many, many years ago, when I was a young man, I had hair, all those kinds of things that go with being in my 20s. Uh, my young wife of the time, now 51 years later, we're still, I know, this is kind of a testimony to her perseverance, okay? That's all I can say. Um, but we, uh, we were very, very young when we got married. I like to think of myself as a child bride, okay? So uh, we became involved in a church called St. Giles Presbyterian Church, and it was pastored by a lead pastor uh, uh, by uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Earl Morey, who all these years later is a very elderly man and, a, uh, and has retired from the EPC. He wasn't in the EPC at the time. I didn't even know what all these letters stood for back in those days. Uh, but one thing that he did that was so foundational for me is uh, on Sunday mornings in Sunday school, he would teach through a book of the Bible. And then in the worship service, he would preach through another book of the Bible. And on Wednesday evenings at our Wednesday dinners, and Bible study, he would teach yet again through another book of the Bible. So in the 10-year span that we were a part of this church, we were constantly hearing his teaching through three books of the Bible. It's very instructive, and you know his fingerprints are all over the way that I do ministry today. And that was the last church that we were part of before going into ministry ourselves. But one of the things that he would do, uh, we took communion uh, once a month. And uh, at, the, at the close of the distribution of the elements and the celebration of the Lord's Supper, he would launch into an incredibly lengthy pastoral prayer. And he would always start that prayer by reciting the first five verses of Psalm 103. So I want you to do the math. Once a month, for 10 years, 
I heard this man recite the first five verses of Psalm 103. And it just made a lasting impact on me. You know, for one thing, it's a little bit nostalgic. You know, every time I engage that particular passage of Scripture, I think about that church, I think about him, I think about where my wife and I were in our walk with the Lord, all the things that that church poured into us. I think about the fact that in recent years, I had an opportunity to actually pour a little bit back into that church. But those five verses are the main text that I want to share with you this morning, and it resonates with the songs we've been singing this morning. So let me read the first five verses of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, David was a king. David was a shepherd. David was all sorts of things that we uncover in Scripture. One of the things that David was, uh, was a musician and a songwriter. I think you probably know that the book of Psalms is a book of songs. So what we're reading here are the lyrics of a song that King David wrote. Now, I'm a musician myself, and I write a lot of songs, and I'm always curious as to what was going through the mind of the songwriter uh, when he or she wrote that particular line. Well, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, okay? David is in a state of worship, okay? I'm, I'm with you so far. Bless the Lord, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Well, now I realize that David's talking to himself. It's like David's looking into a mirror and he's saying, hey, David, praise the Lord. With everything that you've got, praise the Lord. And then he says, bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Wait a minute. Why does David have to remind himself to remember God's benefits? Answer, he forgets. You ever forget? Do you ever find yourself living your life uh, unaware of all that you have in Christ? I know I do, even in ministry. You know, any time in the middle of the afternoon, I'll, I'll realize, you know what? I've been working all day in ministry, and I've been working in my own strength. I forgot. I forgot all the benefits that I have in being a child of God. So David is telling himself, wake up. Don't forget the benefits that you have. And, you know, if we were to read through the Old Testament this morning, we would see over and over and over again people like Moses saying, do not forget the Lord your God. Why does God have to tell us that so many times? Answer is, we forget. We slide into everyday life, into the mundane, and just punch out another 24 hours on the planet and sometimes we forget whose we are, and we forget what we have. And so David, David gives us a reminder. Now, these benefits that are listed here heals all your diseases, forgives all your sins, redeems your life. You know what this is? This is the gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here, buried in the Old Testament, we actually have a bit of an explanation of what the good news is. What is the good news? What are these benefits that we have as followers of Christ? Well, our sins are forgiven. 
Our diseases are healed. Our lives are redeemed from the pit. We're crowned with steadfast love and mercy. Our youth is renewed. Now, I used to read these verses when I was 35, and it would talk about the renewal of youth. Wouldn't mean that much to me. Now that I'm 73, it means a lot. I'm looking very much forward to my youth being renewed. I don't know about you, but, you know, my body is 73, but inside I'm still about 42. You know how that works? Sometimes I'm shocked when I walk down like a hallway and I glance my reflection in a mirror and I'll go, what's my dad doing here? How did that happen? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought of the gospel as a solution? And I would submit to you, the gospel is not only a solution, it's the solution. The gospel of Jesus Christ, these benefits that we're reading about in Psalm 103, a thousand years before Christ, This is the solution, okay? Fine. Then what is the problem? What is the problem that the gospel solves? Now, you've probably heard many times in your life the expression, there's only two things certain in life, right? What? Death and taxes. Okay, I I get it. Uh, but I, I want to make a little bit of an adjustment to that expression. I've come to believe that the problem is really not death and taxes. The problem is, the real problem, is death and sin. Okay? And sin is in the role of the antagonist. Okay? How does that work? Well, Scripture informs us that there is a cause and effect relationship between sin and death. You know those passages in Romans? What does it say? Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin is death. You know, in other words, the consequence of sin is death. If I commit sin, I'm going to die, okay? Doesn't get much more serious than that, okay? Now, here's here's the problem. Some of us can sort of look at that statement and go, yeah, but that's not really about me because I'm not all that bad. You know, if God's grading on a curve... I'm probably in the upper percentile. So I don't feel the threat. I think maybe that's not really talking about me. I'm a fairly nice guy. I'm a decent person most of the time, at least on the outside. What goes on inside? Well, that's my business. Okay? But then I read in Romans again, Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, in the original Greek, the word all means all. Okay? There's there's no trick to this. You know, there's no smoke and mirrors. All means all. Now, Jesus has said, hey, just be perfect like my Father in heaven is perfect. And what's, what's another expression we're very familiar with? Well, nobody's perfect. Why is it that no one is perfect? Well, it's because everybody sins. Our problem is sin. That is our problem. We sin. We all sin, and we're all going to die. If, if all we have is the information I've shared thus far, that's where we're stuck. We're all sinners, and we're all going to die. Unless we can find a solution 
to the sin and death problem. Now, that's where the gospel comes in. Well, let's look at this from another angle. Uh, not only do, do we have a problem, but God has a problem. It might be a strange thought to you, but, you know, God faces certain challenges. God has a problem. What's the problem that God is facing? Well, it's very closely related to our sin and death problem. It looks like this. God wants to be with us for all eternity. Believe it or not, we are his highest creation, made in his image. And he wants to spend eternity with us. But he can't. There's a problem. He can't be with us because he's holy and we're not. And holiness and unholiness cannot coexist. Wouldn't you be disappointed if you found out that sin was allowed in heaven? That would sort of change the whole equation, wouldn't it? Okay, well, holiness and unholiness don't mix. God can't be with us. We can't be with him. It's a classic lose-lose situation. Unless, unless God can find a solution to this holiness-unholiness problem. So there's this dilemma. We are destined for death. And God is destined to be separated from us unless there's a solution. Now, we don't have the capacity to create the solution. Fortunately, God does. Now, let's go back to King David, shepherd extraordinaire and songwriter. And let's think about David's life for a moment. You know, if you look at the, the span of David's life and the, all of the ups and downs, you see it just about everything. You know, there's the triumphant boy David who defeats Goliath. So we're off to a great start. David's the hero. David becomes the king of Israel. By God's own decree. David is mighty in battle. David is an accomplished musician. David has all sorts of skills and talents that God has blessed him with. But he also has a lustful eye and allows his power to be used in ways that are very destructive. He commits adultery, virtually commits murder. Talk about the pendulum swinging back and forth. And yet God refers to David as a man after his own heart. How is that possible? Well, among the writings of David, we have an amazing glimpse into what repentance and confession looks like. And we find that in Psalm 51. Very familiar passage. But let me read this. Let me read this for you. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, David has realized his sinful self and he's laying his sinful self at the feet of God Almighty, repenting and asking for mercy. I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. 
Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God has made a way to overcome our sin and death. God has made a way to overcome his separation from us due to that mismatch between holiness and unholiness. And what happens when someone repents of sin? Well, let's take a quick look at 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, this is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, and he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, what happens here is that God has found a way to solve our sin and death problem. And God has found a way to solve his separation problem. And that way is through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, when we're introduced to Jesus by John the Baptist, how does he describe Jesus? From John 1, uh, verse 29, Jesus is coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. And it says, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, that is about as succinct an explanation of the gospel as you're ever going to find. What is the essence of the good news? That Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, how has God solved this problem of sin and death? How has God solved the problem of holiness and unholiness? He has solved it through Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, how does this work exactly? Recently, I had a... I mean, very recently, less, less than two weeks ago, I had an opportunity to, to spend some time with a gentleman who was very, very, very close to death. And uh, he had multiple medical issues uh, that had been going on as long as about 12 or 13 years ago. And he sort of reached the point where he just couldn't, he couldn't continue. Now, his faith was very shaky He was unclear on many of uh, the aspects of the faith, how things fit together, what they meant. Um, But he had decided on this particular day, this was Monday two weeks ago, he had decided to refrain from any further treatment. And one such treatment was dialysis. And so... That Monday, he was scheduled for his routine dialysis treatment, but he decided not to go, and the family had arranged for hospice care to be coming in later in the day. And so um, I was somewhat connected with this whole situation, so I got a text 
uh, about this and said, is there any possible way you could get by his house today and spend some time with him? And so I did. And uh, as I sat there by his bedside, and he was wired up to all kinds of things, he wanted to know, first of all, how is it that, that you came to faith and have remained in this faith for so long? And so that gave me an opportunity to share with him a little bit of how, how God had worked in my life, sort of interrupted where I was headed with truth and changed the direction. And I sort of explained my personal testimony to him. And uh, we got to the end, and he started talking about the cross. He said, well, you know, when I was a kid, I heard about the cross, and I know Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins, but how does Jesus dying on the cross save me from my sins? How does that make sense? So I explained the whole idea of Christ as the unblemished lamb of God. I connected to the idea of the Old Testament sacrifices to cover sin. I, I said to him, you don't have any problem recognizing that people sin, do you? He goes, no, are you kidding me? I said, you don't have any trouble recognizing yourself as one who has committed sins, do you? No. He said, most of my life has been wrapped around sin. He said, that's why I'm having so much trouble right now. So I explained to him how Jesus is the unblemished lamb of God. How so? He lived a perfect life, an unblemished life, a life without sin, which qualified him to pay that price. I explained to, to Ricky, I said, it's like you've been convicted, but Jesus is going to take care of your sentence. He goes, oh, okay, okay, I see that. So he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. Okay, great. And he said, so that's all there is to it. I said, no, 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 no. That's kind of half the story. So when Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins, that was God's solution for sin. And what that would enable you to do is die and be buried in a holy condition. But you'd stay in the ground. There's another piece to the puzzle. He said, what's that? I said, the resurrection Jesus was raised from the dead as what Scripture refers to as the first fruit of the resurrection. I said, so what that means is those of us who follow after Christ are the rest of the fruit of the resurrection. So Jesus died on the cross to take care of your sins. Jesus was raised from the dead so that you could be raised from the dead and spend eternity with God the Father. And he looked at me just as clear, and he said, Oh, so that's how it works. Bingo. That's how it works. God has provided a solution for sin. God has provided a solution for death. The lose-lose situation has become a win-win situation. Now, I want to uh, start heading toward the close here by going back to Psalm 103. What I have found in Psalm 103 is a, a very clear way of explaining the gospel to folks that are searching. It might seem a little odd to be using an Old Testament text to share the good news of Jesus Christ, but it's all here. 
uh, on that last visit with, with Ricky, I read him Psalm 103, and we went line by line. I said, here's what you have in Christ. All of your iniquity, all of your sin is forgiven. All of your diseases, kidney problems, heart problems, pacemaker, uh, valve replacement, okay, double lung transplant. I said, all this stuff that you've been living with for the last 12 or 13 years is about to disappear. The moment you step into eternity, all of your diseases are going to be healed. God is redeeming your life from the pit as we speak. The steadfast love of God and his mercy is pouring out on you at this very moment. God is satisfying you with eternal goodness. And your youth is about to be renewed like the eagles. That is the gospel. That is the solution to sin. That is the solution to death. Now, I left Ricky's room that day. Uh, They were bringing in the hospital bed as I was going out. And I knew I probably wouldn't see him uh, again. But I was, was a little shocked when the, less than 24 hours later, I got a text that, that he had passed. And all I could say was, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I'm absolutely confident that that gentleman is with the Lord at this moment having the time of his life. That's the gospel. That's the solution. Let's pray. Lord God, I'm so grateful that you just don't leave us to ourselves to try to figure out how we might might save ourselves. We just simply can't do that. But you've done that for us. Your love for us is... Uh, so beyond anything that we can really fathom. All we can do, Father, is seek your, your word, your truth, seek to understand uh, your perspective, the things that you've provided for us. We can never wrap our minds a- around all of it, but we can wrap our minds around some of it, the some, the some of it that matters in terms of our eternal destiny. So I thank you, Father, that you, you do step into people's lives with truth, with love, with grace, with mercy, that you are the forgiver of sins, that you are uh, the resurrection uh, uh, of, of our souls, that we might be with you forever and ever and ever and ever. I just thank you so much, Father, for all that you do in our lives. And I thank you for this explanation that you've given us in Psalm 106. That's inspiring, it's encouraging, it's instructive. But it also gives us uh, a a model, a a framework for how we might share this gospel with folks around us. So thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.